I want to read a portion of scripture that is taken from the 21st chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. And I want to read 11 verses of that. Reading today from the New International Version of the Scriptures. It is the traditional Palm Sunday text. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. May the Lord bless unto us the reading and hearing of this portion of God's sacred word. Let us pray. Grant now again, O God, the presence of your spirit in this place and the anointing of your spirit upon all who share in this moment. May the preacher speak with truth. May the people's hearts be opened. May your name be praised. May your reign on earth come. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk for a while from the thought, a question in the crowd. A question in the crowd. There's a story from the life of Howard Thurman I would like to share with you as a way to begin. Howard Thurman had been on the faculty at Howard University for some years and then decided that he was going to uproot himself and move all the way across the country to go to San Francisco, California to launch an intentional interracial ministry in that city. And yet not long after he had been there, he got a call to uproot himself again and fly all the way back across the country to Boston to be the dean of the chapel at Boston University. Washington to San Francisco. San Francisco to Boston. And someone asked Howard Thurman why it was he was willing to move 
so often and sometimes so quickly. To which Howard Thurman said, I want to put myself in a place where I can have what he called maximum contagion. Maximum contagion. I, whatever it is that I have, whatever it is that I'm going to teach, whatever it is that I'm going to say, whatever it is that I'm going to do, I want to do it in the place where I get the most bang for the buck. I don't want to spend my life outside of a place where if I did it right and I did it well, it could have the maximum effect. I want to put myself in a place where I can have maximum contagion. I want it to rub off on somebody. I want somebody to catch what I've got. I want what I have to be infectious. I want to be where I can have maximum contagion. I think that's what Jesus was doing as well. I think he was putting himself in a place where he would have maximum contagion. I think Jesus knew that if he was going to impact the world, he would not be able to do it from Bethlehem. If you want to move the world, you're not going to move the world from Nazareth or Capernaum. You've got to get away from the small towns and go to a place where the currents are quicker and where the traffic is heavier and where the ideas move back and forth more quickly. You've got to put yourself where people are coming and going and you have a better chance of having somebody from far away come and pick up what you say and take it someplace else. Jesus was leaving those small towns behind. He was going to the biggest city he could reach. He was going for maximum contagion. Paul had the same idea. Paul went to all of these little cities along the way, but Paul always had his eye on Rome. He was stopping at Corinth, he was stopping at Ephesus, he was stopping in Thessalonica, but he always had his mind on a bigger city and maximum contagion. I pass this advice on to you as well. If you want to make a difference in the world, every now and then ask yourself if you're in the right place to do it. You can't, you can't move the world from some place where nobody else ever goes. I, I understand if a man can write a better book or build a better mousetrap, even if he builds his house in the woods, the world will make a beaten path to his door. True enough. But it wouldn't hurt if you put that mousetrap someplace where the traffic pattern was already present. And so Jesus on Palm Sunday parades himself into town to have the biggest impact he can on the biggest city he could reach. And when he got there, the city said, who is this? We think about Palm Sunday as if everybody in sight was waving palm branches. Our sense of Palm Sunday is that everybody in town already knew who Jesus was. There were some people who did know who Jesus was. But read the text. Read verse number 10. And the people in the city were stirred with the question, who in the devil is this? Got all these people waving these palm branches, lying their coats on the ground. Who is this? Now, there are two ways to answer this question, but you have to get the right vocal inflection. One way is to answer it with a little contempt in your voice. Kind of a big city looking down on a small town boy. Who is this? I mean, what, look at him. He, Look at what he's wearing. Look at what he's riding. Who is this from, from, from Bethlehem and Nazareth got the nerve to come parading into Jerusalem? Who? Come on, man, who is this? 
Now see, that wouldn't make sense if they knew who he was, but because they did not know who he was, they simply looked upon him with the kind of contempt that you might expect. Who? You recall that scene in, uh, in Malcolm X when uh, Malcolm Little first goes to New York City? And he goes inside a small's paradise and he's wearing this bright red suit and this great big wide brim hat and a feather sticking out of the hat and red and white shoes. He just knew he was somebody and he got inside a small paradise and they were just as clean and elegant as they could be and everywhere he went somebody looked at him with the same contempt. Who is this? Let your imagination run. Before you knew who Jesus was, there were people in Jerusalem who had absolutely no idea. It was a city, by the way, of well over a quarter of a million people with 12 gates in and 12 gates out. And folk at the other 11 gates didn't even know that he was there. He simply was a stranger in town. Who is But you could change the inflection and go from the contemptual sound, who is this, to the genuinely impressed sound, who is this? All these folk are following him, who is this? Pharisees saying, nobody ever came out when we came to town with a parade like this. Who is this? Roman soldiers saying, even when Pontius Pilate came to town, he got no welcome reception like this. Who, who is this? Now, on this Palm Sunday, it is somewhere between these two inflections. The contemptuous rejection on sight and the overly impressive assumption he must be somebody special. That I now pose the question to you. Who is this? Jesus asked his disciples, who, who do men say that I am? And they skirted around the issues. Well, some say you are Jeremiah or John the Baptist, come back to life. Some say you are one of the prophets. All right, all right, all right. That's who they say I am. They don't really know me. They have not really walked with me. I expect some vague answer from them. But I want to know now, who do you say that I am? And I really think that that question echoes ever more loudly with every passing year inside of every church that I know of. In the end, the ultimate question is, who is this? Who do you say Jesus is? Because if you don't have an answer to that question, really, all the rest that we do in church is sort of mislocated. <clears throat> we don't do what we do or say what we say or shout like we shout or work like we work out of some unknown basis of purpose. We do all of these things because of the answer to the question. Who do you say? On your 130th anniversary coinciding with Palm Sunday, who do you say Jesus is? Well, let me, let, me, let me prod you a little bit by giving my answers. You can overhear me wrestling with it. I, I say that Jesus, this, this, this man who processed in on Palm Sunday is first of all, the lifter of my soul and the savior from my sins. You gotta start personally. You gotta start with what the Lord has done for you. you. You can't do anything for me if you can't tell me what the Lord has done for you. I wanna know what the Lord has done in your life. I wanna know how God has moved in your life. What has God done for you? Now, I gotta testify because I don't want you to be confused by blue robes and impressive resumes. 
my hometown of Chicago. I belonged to the Blackstone Rangers. I was a hoodlum and a fool and wild and reckless. I should either have been dead or in prison. I don't know how I got out. No, I do know how I got out. I had a lot of friends named Jay, but none of them were Jesus. Jack, Daniels, Jim, Beam, Johnny, black and red. I miss this blue one. I don't know. This must have happened after I got through with this. But, and I never left home without them. I was, I was on a downward spiral. Then I, then, I, then I stepped back from that beginning. And I asked myself, how in the world that I get from where the, from the mess I was in on the south side of Chicago in the 1950s and 60s and now I am the president of the school to which Martin Luther King Jr. was enrolled. How did I get from there to there? I mean, what happened? can say is what a mighty God we serve who can pick you up turn you around put your feet on solid ground what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart there's a friend of mine back in Cleveland. His name is Julian Earls. Julian used to work for NASA. He's now retired. Julian Earls used to say, if you ever see a turtle sitting on a fence post, you know he did not get there by himself. Turtles occupy low ground. They, they crawl, scratching in the dirt and the mud and the muck and the mire, and they do not fly, and they do not climb, they cannot self-propel. So if a turtle ever gets on the fence post, it means somebody reached down and picked them up and put them someplace they otherwise never would have reached. I just wonder, Ebenezer, are there any turtles in the church today who know that God reached down and picked you up and put you someplace? that you never would have reached by yourself. Won't God lift you up? Won't God set you free? Won't God deliver you? I don't care what your past was. He can get underneath that and put you in a place that is just so remarkable that all you can do is say, what a mighty God we serve. That's who Jesus is. He's the lifter of our souls and the savior from our sins. But he, see that's, that's the individual personal relationship. I hope you don't just get satisfied with that. I want you to get saved. But once you get saved, then what? On your way to heaven? Straight line? No work in, in the middle, no labor, no, no advocacy, no intervention, just you and the Lord, one-on-one, -on -one, I hope not. I hope you will see that Jesus is also the one who sustains us through the storms. We are in the storms right now. This madness that they call a Republican presidential campaign is a storm.
this is as close to an episode of the Three Stooges as I have ever seen. I mean, this is Mo, Larry, and Curly. One buffoon trying to out buffoon the other buffoons. Ask them any question, and all they can say is, it's all because of Barack Obama. Whatever's wrong, Obama did it. Oh, listen, that man has brought more dignity to the White House than this country could ever imagine. Children never got in trouble. No shame in his background, no breakdown in his family. Even grandma got a clean slate. But, but, but they just beat up on him. They just beat up on him. Well, listen, we've been, we have been beat up before. Getting beat up as a black person is not new. We've been getting beat up for 400 years. Beat up. How did we get through the previous beatings is the way we're going to get through this beating. The Lord will make a way somehow. Young people are infatuated with Black Lives Matter. And they should be. I have no fault with their appeal that Black Lives Matter. They have, they have witnessed things that they did not think they would see in 21st century America. They've seen Trayvon Martin. They've seen Tamir Rice. They've seen people who are just being brutalized and shot and choked and strangled. And they cry out from despair and from broken hearts, sometimes with an exclamation point, sometimes almost with a question mark. Sometimes they are affirming black lives matter. But then a headline comes and it makes them wonder, do black lives matter in America? <clears throat> Given our rates of poverty, do black lives matter? Given our incarceration rate, do black lives really matter in America? Okay, so let me say this to them and, and to all of those who are struggling with the black lives matter question. Black lives have never really mattered in America. They have, they have, they have never really mattered. If, if, if I'm wrong, then why were the girls in Birmingham bombed and Emmett Till cut up and Jimmy Lee Jackson shot? Why were we three-fifths of a person if black lives mattered? Why was the right to vote so hard to get if black lives matter? Here's my point. It has always been a storm to be black in America. And those who have come through the storm were those who learned how to lean on the everlasting arms. I find myself really intrigued by the second verse. I was telling these young budding preachers over here, the second verse of lift every voice and sing, stony the road we try. Bitter, chastening rod felt in the days when hope unborn had died. But you know what? They didn't put a period there. They put a comma. Yet. Black history is what happens on the other side of the comma. Yet. The Dred Scott decision, comma. Yet. The fugitive slave law, comma. Yet. Shadow slavery, comma. Yet, shot Medgar Evers, yet, shot Martin King, yet, somehow we find our strength on the other side of the comma, yet with a steady beat. Have now our weary feet come to the place for which our fathers sighed. The Lord 
has brought us this far. I just wonder if you believe that or do you think you were just that smart? You thought your way here. You, you, you paid your way here. You, somebody else brought you here. No, no, I, I, I just really believe that Jesus, who is the savior from my sins, is a sustainer of my life through all of the storms that go on around me and the same God who brought us from the four. The same God will bring her through this. I don't know if it can get any worse. It can't get any crazier. But I trust in God. I know that every year, 1% of the people in this country walk away from Christianity. The Pew Research Center says every year for the last decade, self-described Christians decline by 1% every year. 1% every year have come to the conclusion that religion has no role to play in their lives. Faith has no foundation in their soul. Church is not a part of their agenda and they find their answers and strength somewhere else. Fine. I cannot stop you from leaving. All I can do is testify for myself. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Do you believe that? On Christ, the solid rock I stand. Do you believe that? All other ground is sinking sand. I don't fault anybody else for their ground, but I picked mine. I don't fault anybody else for their faith, but I picked mine. You can go away from the Lord if you want to. I'm not going anywhere. I've come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord. He is the sustainer of our souls through the storms of life. He is. He, he, that's who Jesus is. He's not some good teacher. No, no, no. He's not just a prophet. No. Not some wise sage. No. I say, you say what you want. This is my turn to testify. I say he is the Alpha and the Omega. I say he is the first and the last and the beginning and the end. I say he is a rock in a weary land. I say he is a shelter in the time of storm. I say if you put your hope in him, he'll bring you safely through. But there's one thing more I want to say. Yeah, 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 he is the... He is the savior from my sins. He is the sustaining force through the storms of life. <laughs> I say, I, I can't speak for you. I say he is a safe harbor at the end of my journey. Sooner or later, I'm 67 years old now. I, the older I get, bless, bless you. We must talk afterwards. Amen. Anybody else want to acknowledge 67? <laughs> but if, if so, then you're thinking what I'm thinking. That's the days of our years are three score year and ten. And I'm getting strangely close to my three score and ten. And so I, I do spend time after pondering the end things. I don't know, I don't know how folks who don't believe in God think about the end things. Maybe you just think that you die and you get buried and that's all there is to it? Fine. 
Perhaps you have no sense of life on the other side of death, no sense of hope in heaven. Perhaps you just think that we live and die like the beasts of the field. You are free in America to believe anything you want or believe nothing at all. But I'm here to preach today, so I'm gonna tell you what I believe by way of a story. <laughs> when I was in Cleveland first four, five, or six years, I was the president of the Cleveland NAACP. And uh, so I was always on TV fussing about something. I mean, if, if nothing was happening, I would find something to fuss about. So folks knew me from, from these uh, occasional appearances on television. So one day I was downtown, in downtown Cleveland, we call it Public Square, Public Square, there's some Cleveland men right there. And I was uh, walking down the street, minding my own business. I was not on this occasion fussing, I was just minding my own business. And a young man stopped me. Great big black hat, bright red bow tie, an arm full of newspapers called The Final Call. And he said to me, preachers, he said to me, you are the TV preacher, we know who you are. And we're here to tell you that you will never be a great man. Well, I'll tell you the truth, friends, I I've never aspired to be a great man. I don't know if I've ever one day awakened and say, today, I'm gonna start trying to be a great man. I just, you know, I'm just trying to get over. I'm just a brother trying to get over, you know. But they piqued my curiosity. I mean, when, they, when you tell me I will never be great, you, now you, you know, now, okay. Why will I, I mean, what, what, I can't do anything to be great? I said, no, because you don't take seriously the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Now, when my grandmother from Kentucky encountered a person who said something to her that would take her breath away, as I often did, she would step back from you and she would fix her eyes on your feet. And then she would raise her sights up your pant legs. And then she would lock in on your belt buckle. And finally she would catch your eye. And Granny would just say to you, mm-hmm. <laughs> so this, this young man put me in Granny mode. So I, you know, when he said that, I, I stepped back. I, 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 you know, it's just DNA. I, I, she just showed up. I stepped back from him. And I looked at his little feet. And I came up his pant legs. And I found his belt buckle and I saw a little red bow tie. And I saw his eyes. And I said to him, mm-hmm. I said, son, there's, there's a piece of history that you don't seem to know about. And since I'm here and we have no place to go, let me introduce you to some historical facts. I said to him, I was, I was living in Chicago. I was there on the day that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad died. And I had folk in my family who belonged to the nation. And, and, and they confirmed for me that he was dead. <laughs> and one of them went to the funeral and looked inside and they made sure it was the honorable. And he was in fact dead. I said, son, since I lived in Chicago and I had no place else to go, I stayed in town all day on the first day. 
to see if anything unusual might happen. But there was no news on the first day. But, you know, I lived there, I got nowhere to go, so I, I stayed in town all day on the second day. I said, son, I'm, I, I'm telling you, I, I was listening. No news on the second day. But I told him, I got up early <laughs> on the third day. And I went walking. I mean, I turned on the television. I, I turned on the radio. I was reading the Jet magazine. They make it right there in Chicago. I said, son, if anything was going to happen, it was going to happen on the third day. I report to you that your man was dead and your man is dead. And I believe your man always will be dead. But now that I've got you at close range, give me a minute to tell you about my man. While I've got you right here, let me report on my man. My man was dead. They watched him die, they heard him die, they took that dead body off the cross, they put that dead body in the grave. There is no doubt my man was dead. And he stayed dead all day on the first day. Stayed dead all day on the second day. Then I shifted my vocalization from early to early. Early. Early on the third day, my man got up with all power in his hands and I serve a living savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. I may not be great, but he lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives. He lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. That's who I say Jesus is. What do you say?